Hello and welcome to my six aviation images with Mike Laundy. In fact, that's a bit of a lie because we spoke over seven images and I decided to keep it in there. So uh, we'll forget about that one. Um, if you want the backstory of a lot of these photographs, please look at the description in this podcast for uh, Mike's chapters of five of them, in fact, about his long aviation career, which is uh, a really interesting listen. So please um, have a look. Um, Anyway, thanks for joining us and uh, hope you enjoy it. The first one we got on the screen. Okay, the, the first picture we got is of two aeroplanes. One is the Isaac's Fury, which is a replica of a 1930s Hawker Fury. And the other one is of a, an RAF Hawk. And the reason the two are connected, if you look closely at the fins, you'll see there's a, sim, a similar symbol in each, on each fin, which is a symbol of 25 Squadron, Royal Air Force. And... Our replica Fury is painted in the in the correct colours of a, a 1930s Hawker Fury fighter um, with 25 Squadron. And uh, a couple of years ago, we were invited to take the airplane to RF Valley for Family's Day. Uh, the first first year we couldn't get there because of the weather. This particular photograph was taken in 2022 when we did get there, and it was perfect weather. And the the first night we were there, we were having a a, a little bit of a do at the officers mess. And this guy came up to me and he said, oh, is that, that your fury in the hangar? Because the airplane had been parked in the hangar overnight. And I said, well, yeah. He said, oh, we don't know me. He said, but I'm the boss of um, 25 Squad. And he said, and I, you know, I love your airplane. It's, in the, it's the, the same colours or the, the same squadron as the one I fly. I'm the boss of 25 Squad and you've got a 25 Squad and Fury. He said, he said, before you go, we've got to have a picture with the two next to the hall. Yes, yeah, good. So hence the picture. And we took the airplanes out on, on the airfield there and got them both photographed, um, I think, Perhaps it got into some of the local papers and, and Anglesey, I'm not sure. But I was invited to sit in the Hawk, which I did. I clamped into the Hawk and I was very impressed by the amount of kit it's got. I had previously been at Valley as a, as a student in 1966-67, flying the Fulham Nat. And the Hawk is a little bit more sophisticated than the, than the Nat was. Although, interestingly, probably not as fast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, I take my hat off to the guys who fly it now because it's uh, you know I chatted with some of the, the sort of students going through a mixture of both navy and air force, and they've got a really hard, intense course I think to mm. go through, particularly with all the electronics and the avionics they have to work with now, which we didn't have. We had a map and a stopwatch when we were flying around, and as I remember flying the NAT in my final nav test, I drew a, a stopwatch from stores because it wasn't one fitted to the airplane. As I started on the first leg, I started the stopwatch and the second hand fell off. <laughs> <laughs> and the instructor in the back said, oh, that's all right. He said, just ask me for the times. It's not the same asking time from somebody with a disembodied voice coming. You've been flying two minutes and 34 seconds. It's not the same as seeing the needle going round. <laughs> and I must admit, I had to redo my final nerve test because I did get slightly lost. All right. <laughs> I, I found what I... I thought it was a valley I needed just to fly up it for a few seconds to find my, my turning point. Well, I flew it up a bit longer than I intended, and I was doing 420 knots at the time, and I finished up 25 miles off course. <laughs> <laughs> Overshoot a bit. So, yeah, that was my valley thing. But it's a really nice photograph. But it's though. a nice photograph of the Hawk, and nice. we, we did put the, the boss of 25 Squadron into the Fury, <clears throat> which he did find quite, quite small. <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> Once we got Brilliant. it. Brilliant. Right, on to the next photograph, which is a really nice young Mike in a chipmunk. That was a very young Mike. <laughs> that would have been taken in 1964 when I first started flying chipmunks with the Air Force. So it's a, an RF chipmunk on the North Airfield at, at Cranwell. Um, and I spent, a, a, I suppose, about 18 months before we started our jet pro flying proper. We just got a taste of flying each week to go and fly the chipmunks. I had a, a lovely ex Second World War flying instructor, a sergeant pilot, sorry, a master pilot, Naismith, who flown Spitfires in the Second World War. And his story to me was he said, Well, he said, it was quite fun to go along the south coast and beating up the gun emplacements and see if we can get the soldiers to jump off the guns or dive flat. He said, One not was particularly strong willed and they, they refused to dive flat on their faces. So he thought I'd come in really, really low, which was fine until I hit the ground the way in, bounced into the air, realised that the aeroplane was unfriable, opened the cockpit, stood up, pulled the ripcord <laughs> and got plucked out by parachute. 
<laughs> which wasn't the accepted way of getting out of it, but he did manage to get out. But the other thing he did, we'd be across the um, Sherwood Forest, you know, over Nottinghamshire, that area, and they were these sort of wooden lookout towers for fires. And all of a sudden, that looks like a flat placement, because I think he went on to fly typhoons and things in the war. And all of a sudden, we'd be in an inverted dive, going down to it, rolling out. <laughs> his, his, my, he's back in the 1940s. <laughs> or if a train was going along, we'd be doing a funny attack on the engine of the train. So it was a great guy to fly with. <laughs> Brilliant fun. Yeah, it's good. Um, so on to the next one. We are cheap. We're going to have two images of your yeah. uh, lovely float plane, but the... Uh, the one over the boat, where was that taken? That was Falmouth Bay, and uh, so it's a, a Mark III kit fox with floats. And, um, yeah, that was a, a bit of a story in itself. Yeah, we've covered that in the, yeah. in the previous podcast, yeah. but um, it's a nice-looking aircraft. You said the, the new one's got a bigger rudder and stuff. Yes, if, if you look at that, that photograph there, you'll see that there's a, a, an additional chunk to the rudder underneath the fin. Mm which was part of the, the kit with the floats, which gave you a little bit more drag at the back end. Not so much drag, more directional stability at, at the back end. And that version of the kit fox was actually easier to fly than the, the, the land version. It was All right. Much Good nicer. Um, where are they made? I'm not familiar with the... Um, In America. They're American, aren't they? Yeah, well, USA, I should say. The US of A. Yeah. Right, so moving on to the next one. Which we are going to do a special on this aircraft, but um, it's a nice picture of the Victor from the front end with the uh, the glazed nose. It is. That's a, a, a Victor B, sorry B two, which is the um, the bomber version of the Victor, and the Mark two version with the Conway engines. Uh, it's a B two BS because it is also fitted with the blue steel. I think you can just about see the the, the tail fin of the the blue steel at the back end there. Just looking mm. at the photograph now. Hard to see, you can just see a little bit for it. It may, may not be quite big, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, that was the blue steel version of the Victor. The glazed nose was because if we went to war, we'd be at low level and our nav plotter would be down in the nose um, navigating us from the what one tends to think of as the bomb aimer's position. We didn't actually have a bomb aimer with it because our bomb was a, a rocket and it was. Uh, <laughs> It had an inertial navigation system, which hopefully will take it to the target. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Didn't matter if it missed by a couple of miles, because it was a multi-megaton bomb. Yeah, it was still, a very, very big, very powerful weapon. Target. Yeah, but yeah. a magnificent aircraft. I say it's always been a favourite of mine. And uh, Very impressive aeroplane. It just it looks so futuristic and a bit sort of Russian-ish in a way, with the glazed nose. And, Excuse but, me? Well, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a real one-off looking aircraft, well, isn't it? I guess if one went into... Battle against the Russians, but one might hope the Russians would think it's a <laughs> Russian. <laughs> but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bank on that one. Right, so on to the next one, which is a really nice formation of uh, the jet stream. Which it's you, a jet stream, so yeah. You were. And uh, in that picture, which I wasn't actually part of that formation, but they're flying past the Air Force College at Cranwell, which of course did form part of my early part of my life, my three years there. But having said that, I did a, a lot of jet stream flying. Probably I flew more jet streams than anything else. I displayed the RF one and the Navy one. And when we had Air Officer Commanding parades and things like that, I never went on parade. I was always in the formation with the jet streams, and mm. usually leading it. So, so you flew the um, the original one and the, uh, the one with Garrett's. Uh, did you ever fly the Jetstream 41? Didn't fly the forty one. The the Air Force had the the Aster Zoo powered. Yeah, just wondered if did actually. <coughs> so, so the Mark One was the Aster Zoo, the Navy mm. Mark II was the Aster Zoo, the Navy Mark Three was Garrett powered. Right. And as a civil pilot I also flew the, the jet stream. Yeah, I just wanted you had an opportunity when you were but at no, the, I didn't, uh, didn't fly, to fly the uh, didn't fly the forty one. The forty one. All oh, right. But obviously uh, it's a major aircraft in your career really, isn't it? It it was for a few years, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I probably spent the longest flying either the Air Force one or the Navy one. And then um, the Navy bought the Mark Threes, and I did a bit of flying in those. And, I always and think it's a bit forgotten, out. really. It's quite a successful aircraft, isn't it, really? It, it did was, well in America, yeah. the commuter market. Was, yeah. And yeah. market and, uh, it's the only military airplane I've had, ever had to put a, a Mayday call out from. I, <laughs> yeah. I think I may have mentioned that before. Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> all these aircraft we're showing here, you can listen to Mike's uh, extensive podcast series <laughs> but, <laughs> about more detail. What I can say from this is it does glide quite well with no engines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and brakes well. <laughs> <laughs> and brakes well, yeah. 
So on to the next one is the lovely Pembroke. Oh, the Pembroke, yes. That's a, a strange aeroplane away, and one I certainly didn't expect to fly. Um, but the, I spent three very pleasant years out in Germany um, flying the Pembroke on 60 Squadron. And uh, again, you can hear if you listen to the, the full podcast on these. But I was basically, my main job when I got out there was to fly a version of it which looked just like that one. They all looked like that, except that when I was flying, I had hidden panels in the floor which slid back with optical glass above and cameras. We had optical glass windows in the side and we were spy planes photographing Basically, the Russians. Yeah. And that was secret up until the, the 1990s. So did the jet stream in fact replace it in a way? Not really, Not no. Really, no. no. The, the, the Pembroke it. was originally the RF Germany Communication Squadron. The Pembroke. That's communications aircraft. Wasn't yeah, it? and they had a few of them in the UK. The Navy had the Navy version, which was called the Sea Prince. That's and the Sea right. Prince was replaced by the jet stream in, in the Navy. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So there was a link in the Navy, yeah. but not in the Air Force. Yeah. And the Air Force kept them going way longer than they would normally have gone, simply because of the pho photography we could do with them um, over East Germany. Yeah. Right, on to the next photograph, which is a, a microlight, which I think you've got a bit of a story to that one. Yes. <laughs> this would have been taken in about 1981, something like that, when my eldest son was in the Boy Scouts and I was part of the parents' committee for the particular scout group. And I'd been at an incredibly boring meeting and the chap I was sitting next to, I got chatting to, and it, I discovered he was into microlighting and weight shift aeroplanes, which were very new then. This was, mm. you know, really, really early stages of it. And he said, oh, look, he said, on this weekend, I'm going up to the airfield of Cark, the southern end of the Lake District, on a microlight meet. Would you like to come along and see it? I thought, yeah, great, I'll come along with you. At the time, I was um, a flying instructor on the, on the Jet Provost and uh, supremely overconfident about my flying ability. <laughs> well, we arrived at Cark and he went off and he flew his little sort of weight shift and you can see from the picture, it was very basic. I, I think the, I can't remember what size the engine was, but I think it was something which was taken off from something like a snowmobile. Uh, it was that sort of engine. Right, a bit crude then. And the- Chainsaw what, engine, I think. <laughs> chainsaw, probably no, chainsaw yeah, yeah. actually, chainsaw engine. And there was a throttle for the right foot on the, what felt like a rudder pedal, which you could push down, so that gave you the power from it. And of course you controlled it with your weight shift. And he briefed me about it before I went off. You'll see there's a thing sticking in front of my face there. Yeah. And that was the airspeed indicator. That's Velcroed onto the pole next to me. And he Velcroed it on, adjusted it, and said, that's about right. And that would tell you roughly what speed you're doing. <laughs> and so the brief I got was, line it up on the runway, hold the bar back, give it full throttle, and when you get 18 miles an hour showing on the ASI, push the bar forward and you'll take off. You'll see in the picture, you can't actually see the wing very much because as I discovered when I got airborne, I couldn't see the wing either. It was so far up above my head. I should have realized there was a problem when I taxied it because if you look at the wheels on it, you'll find it's like a handlebars on a bicycle. So if you push your right foot forward, you go left, <laughs> which is not how an airplane, a conventional airplane operates. You no. put your right foot forward and you go right. And it was obvious what it did, except when you actually start doing it. And every time, you know, I was zigzagging from side to side down the runway, thinking, oh, damn it, I've got to move the foot the other way. So anyway, then I start the takeoff run. I go along the runway, get 80 knots, push the bar away, and up it goes, as you can see in that picture. That was when I just got airborne. And then I'm thinking, I'm used to flying attitudes. And you look at through the windscreen of the airplane, you see the position of the combing, and you see the horizon, and you can see what attitude you're at. All I could see in front of me was this bar I was holding, which I appeared to be moving. <laughs> and I looked up and there's the point of the wing way up above. I couldn't really see the wing you know, normally when I was flying. Yeah. And um, it started off all right for about the first couple of hundred feet. And then I got a gust of wind and it dropped its wing to the left. Well, my instinctive reaction was to correct to the right, which is what one does in a normal airplane. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a weight shift airplane. So when I moved the bar to the right, my actual weight went to the left. So the airplane rolled left instead of rolling right. And it started going down. And again, my instinctive reaction was to pull back, which pulled my weight forward. So it went down even steeper. So I quickly went into quite a steep 
spiral dive to the left. And I can remember looking at this field of sheep with a barbed wire across it. <laughs> the barbed wire was staying constant in my vision. The rest of the field was expanding in both directions and the sheep were running. <laughs> and I realised I was about to crash. So I then thought, what have I got to do? I could have put everything in the other way. So I just shoved everything in the other way. I pushed as hard as I could and I pushed the bar in the opposite direction to what felt correct. And it stopped going down and the nose suddenly shot up into the sky and it stalled and everything's flapping and banging above my head. And then I'm working like a demon, pushing and pulling on this damn bar, trying to get this airplane under control. And all I wanted to do was to land it. I found it very difficult. I've, I've seen a thing on um, a television, somebody riding a bicycle where you pedal it backwards to go forwards and yeah. turn the handlebars right to go left. And I can say it was like that for me with all the you know, experience I got on, on powered aircraft. And also being, as I said earlier, supremely overconfident with the fact that I was purifying a jet provost at the time and thought I could fly anything. <laughs> and all of a sudden I found I couldn't. But I had to get it down. It took me nearly half an hour to get it down. Every time I lined it up with the runway to land, I'd get a slight gust of wind and it would roll a bit to the left. And because of the engine torque, I was losing control if I tried to roll it to the right. I could just about fly it doing a left-hand turn, but I couldn't do right-hand turns. And every time I lined up, it would get knocked off the runway again by a gust. And in the end, I thought, I've just got to go down now. I just managed to point it at the runway, took the power off, and down it went. The runway came up. I pushed hard. It landed. It started veering over to one side. I took my feet off the rudder pedals, put them on the ground, and with my foot skidding along the ground, kept the thing from rolling over and came to a halt. <laughs> and the owner came up from where he'd been hiding behind a stone wall. And apparently he'd been saying to everybody else, I can't bear to watch. Tell me when he crushes it. And they kept saying, he hasn't crushed it yet. He keeps coming around and going around again. <laughs> and he said, why didn't you crush it? He said, I've seen guys do that before. They've always crashed. I said, the only thing that saved me was that when it was going wrong, I thought my way through it and I didn't panic. <laughs> I was close <laughs> to it, but I didn't panic. And I thought what I had to do. I didn't know how to do it properly, but I, I thought what I had to do and, um, and eventually got it down. And it was always in the back of my mind that incident you know it was it's one mm. of the more traumatic things that's happened to me in an airplane <laughs> it's such a silly little airplane as well so years and years later um when i just finished flying the private jet i had to stay out of the, the country for a certain amount of time for tax purposes right so i was thinking of things to do before i came back to the uk and one of them was to go to portugal and to what was a guy named jerry breen i think it was who ran a, a, a microlight school in the down in the algarve and so I went down there for a fortnight with him. And um, he said, right, I'm going to teach you how to fly weight shift properly. And they were much more sophisticated than that thing. It's sort of, it's like, you know, riding a motorbike really, yeah. with a big sort of coat on and all the rest of it. And we went up and gradually we, I got it right. And he was going, go left, go right, go up, go down, go left. And, and you know, I was doing it mm. and we're going along. He said, great. This is on my third trip, I think it was. He said, let's go back and you can do some solo. So I went back to the airfield and it was fine. I came down, flared it, <laughs> wing dropped and I went the wrong way. <laughs> and there was a strangled cry from the back as he corrected it. <laughs> and I said, Jerry, that was fantastic. I said, I really enjoyed that. It's got rid of all the demons and I'm never going to fly one again. <laughs> <laughs> that's the question I was going to ask. So on to this original one then. Do you, that's, did he, is that still going or? I have no idea. No idea. I you no don't idea. Really care, I, do you? <laughs> well, not really, no. I lost contact with it. Well, well, that, at least, it looks something familiar to nowadays. Some of the other things they had flying there, they had a thing which was, it was like a flying wing with what you would think of as the, the rudder at the wingtips. Right. So if a guy wanted to go right, he would pull on a wire which would put the wingtip flat onto the airflow and it yaw it around that direction. And he sat on a sort of stretcher, wasn't strapped in, uh. and to go down, he'd slide himself forward, and to go up, he'd slide himself back. And I thought... That just looks bloody dangerous, but it flew all right. That's some weird and wacky ones. I've seen that one it's on really uh, wacky in ones, yeah. obviously in Germany. It's yeah. the one with the bloke's legs out of a completely enclosed one. He just runs along and jumps off and tucks his leg yeah. up. We got a little cab. Well, well, later on, I did. I did fly a powered parachute. I did a powered parachute course um, up in Wales. That was much easier, mm. um, and I had a, I suppose, a couple of days learning how to fly the parachute standing on the ground. Um, the odd thing with it is. To lift the parachute up, you need to be facing the parachute with the wind blowing towards it. But when you turn round the other way, then you've got the parachute behind you. 
Now, when the parachute is behind you or above your head, if you put on the right hand one, you go right. If you put on the left one, you go left. But when you turn around, everything's crossed over. So everything works the wrong way again. So it took a little bit to get used to that. But it's all right when you're in the air. And so I know the first takeoff I did, you had a hand throttle and you're holding the hand throttle and you're holding the, the reading lines up to the chute. And I open the throttle and you start running. Mm. And they did give me a dual one, first of all. With the dual one, you had a, a metal bar between you and the instructor. And they attached the parachute so it lifted the guy in the front off first. So as you went running along, the <laughs> the brief I got from the instructor was keep running even when your feet aren't on the ground. Because if we come down again, it's not like a wheel. You've got to be running. <laughs> yeah. And um, that was great because he, he got it off and he showed me the basics and he could pass me the the cords for it and it was in the air it was straightforward you pull on the right when you turn right mm. pull on the left when you turn left you open the throttle you went up you close the throttle you went down and um, so then they let me go solo and I went running along with this thing up in this sort of Welsh hill top place with with big sort of bushes sort of rather prickly ones around the place and I can remember it was a bit like being on the moon as the faster you go the, the lighter you become yeah. but you still got to keep your feet going along the ground yeah. and I was like jumping over bushes and I thought well I'm, I'm flying now so I lifted my feet and after they said you're bloody lucky they said your ass came down to within about a foot of the crown <laughs> <laughs> and up it went and um, I, I sort of flew a circuit in it and came in and, and landed very uncomfortable because it had a sort of a strap which you could get your backside on I couldn't get onto it mm. and so I'm just dangling from this thing which is a bit unpleasant around the, the yeah. nether regions <laughs> so they say oh look if we, if we tie a bit of rope with a loop on it onto the seat bit then when you're able hook your foot into that pull it down and you can slide it out of your backside which I did and that worked quite well and I found you could do really tight turns you could open the throttle pull down hard on one side and you could just literally spin it on the spot mm. the only other slight problem I found was I wear spectacles I wear very focals and the very focals a close up at the bottom, distance at the top, you can see what's coming because the angle you're coming down and it's quite steep. Right. And the ground comes up and I suddenly realised that the ground is completely out of focus. <laughs> so the bottom of my glass, I've got my head down on my chest trying to see the ground coming up. <laughs> but um, and the other thing was um, part of the kit you had was a mirror. Because uh, obviously one likes to look good for the camera. <laughs> um, but more importantly you held it down to one side and you you had a clear fuel tank behind you and you could look in the mirror and see how much fuel you had in the tank behind you. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> Simple but effective as well. So, it was, yeah. yeah. But you've definitely retired from that kind of flying. Actually, you know, I, didn't, I wouldn't mind flying the power parachute again. I, oh, okay. I'm, I'm quite tempted to do that because it was quite Have you seen fun. that guy who flies locally around Western? I have, yeah. yeah. I haven't seen him for a while, but he's yeah. always up and about on a nice clear night and stuff. Well, it's possibly morning. because the undercarriage is a bit weak on them. Mm. It's your legs. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so, why not? But you can get them with uh, like a little tricycle undercarriage. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's so many frame underneath. Yeah. But they are easy. To, well, I, I I found it quite easy to fly when mm. you're flying. I also like the idea of having the parachute open before I took off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that could be dead useful, couldn't it? But yeah, that that's the reason that little pictures there. Brilliant. Um, well, yeah. Thanks for that and showing your pictures. <laughs> and uh, um, you can see the uh, links to the other podcasts in the. Uh, description area and uh, thanks for that Mike and uh, we speak to you soon. You're very welcome, let's hope I survive. <laughs> yeah, cheers. <laughs>